That's wonderful. I appreciate it. Um, it's so good seeing many of your laptops here. Um, I will be demonstrating the code. This will be a little bit different than what I've been doing before. I started giving lots of slides on Wednesday. Um, very little code, mostly slides. Yesterday, the transition was into more code. But today is going to be even more code still. Um, because we're going to be talking about JSON, JavaScript object notation. And I understand that many of you are probably Java developers. How many of you are Java developers right now? Ah, very good, very good. Now, my company, thirstyhead.com, focuses on Groovy and Grails advocacy and training. I'm going to be doing some Groovy and Grails examples up here. But what we're talking about today, Jason, is not tied to Grails any more than it's tied to Java or .NET, or Ruby on Rails, or, or anything else. But since this is primarily a, a, a Java conference, let me start by asking you a question. And I want you to be honest. You can't hurt my feelings, I promise you. How many of you hate JavaScript? Show of hands. How many of you hate JavaScript? Ah, oh, many of your hands went up very quickly, didn't they? Yes, hate it. Help me out. Why do you hate JavaScript? What's one thing that you hate the most? If you can narrow the list to just one. <laughs> it's very unstable. Yes, yes, I, I agree with you. That. And by the way, when I'm asking this, there are no wrong answers. What I want to do is, is kind of clear the air. I could not agree with you more that in Java, we are very, very committed to the idea of right once run anywhere, aren't we? I mean, the beautiful thing is I can write Java code on my Apple laptop and upload it to a Solaris server, and it just works. Or I could be doing development on a Windows box and push it over to a Linux machine, and it just works. That's not the case in JavaScript, is it? It's write once debug everywhere. So that is a very real problem. It is a very real problem. It's getting better and better because our platform is not run by one particular company, Sun Microsystems or Oracle in this case. Because we're depending on each browser to provide the JavaScript runtime environment. And because these browser manufacturers historically competed on building incompatible platforms instead of compatible platforms, that was very problematic. Netscape Navigator came out and said, we can do this. And Internet Explorer said, aha, we can do everything they can do, but we're going to add some features that Netscape doesn't have. And then Netscape comes back and says, aha, we can do everything Internet Explorer can do, and then some different things. That argument was valid in 1995, 1996. It's still not perfect, and quite frankly, it never will be perfect. The browser manufacturers will never provide us as stable a platform as Sun does. But the browsers now are getting more and more standards compliant. As a matter of fact, ECMAScript, have you heard of this? ECMA? The ECMA is the European Computer Manufacturers Association. Now, no one is bound to be ECMAScript compliant. ECMA is an, imp is an interface, if you will, not an implementation. You can't really run ECMAScript. But what you can do is you can say, all right, here's the standard. How well does Firefox implement the ECMAScript standard? How well does Internet Explorer? How well does Safari? How well does Opera? How well do all, all of these kinds of things? It is getting better, but it's not perfect, and it never will be. Yeah, and I'm not saying you don't feel that way. I feel that way as well. I really do. I really do. It breaks my heart that we can't all just agree and compete on standards. But what you have to realize in the web is, you just have to let those feelings go. You can't let them frustrate you. You know, that is the way it is. And so what we find, there are JavaScript libraries that do a wonderful job of normalizing it. It could be prototype. It could be jQuery. jQuery is incredibly popular. I mean, that's probably the go-to library today. But it could be Dojo. It could be YUI. There are ways that we can begin normalizing those different browser differences out there. But those browser differences will never go away, much like traffic jams in Bangalore. 
You can get frustrated when they happen, or you can say, ah, this is how it is driving in Bangalore. We will react and handle the situation gracefully. So that is part of our role as a JavaScript developer. Thank you for being brave for and answering that. A couple of you others hate JavaScript as well. Who else hates JavaScript for a different reason? Let's clear the air. It behaves differently in different browsers, absolutely. How about this? Are you a Java developer? Yeah, yeah. The worst thing they could have done is named this Java script. Yeah, yeah. Worst name ever. Because JavaScript is not Java. It's not a light version of Java. JavaScript makes it sound like it's Java Junior that someday when it grows up and becomes an adult, it'll be just like Java? No, not the case at all. Does anyone remember what JavaScript used to be named before it was named JavaScript? In Netscape Navigator 2.0, it was called, absolutely, well done. I don't remember, I, yes, yes, Live Script. This again, if you can imagine, this is back before Java was very popular. Java came out in about this 1996 time frame. That's about the same time as the rise of the web. And so Netscape Navigator in a pre-release said, we got this thing called Live Script. And Java was getting a lot of buzz. It was coming out and it had a lot of popularity and a lot of interest. And they said, hey, you know what? We use curly braces and semicolons too. Why don't we call this JavaScript and try to capitalize on a lot of the buzz of Java? But in fact, these are two very different languages. Java is a strongly typed language. We have to say string name equals Scott. We need to say list languages equals new array list. JavaScript is not strongly typed at all. It's dynamically typed. We say var. Var name equals Scott but I could just as easily say var name equals 12 or var name equals true. It drives me crazy as a Java developer that you can do that. But you know, you need to exhale and say this is not a strongly typed language. This is a dynamic language. And there are actually benefits to that as well. Because I said this yesterday, one man's bug is another man's language feature. In JavaScript, if you mistype a method, what have you done? You've created a new method on that class. Are you kidding me? No, in JavaScript, that's a compiler error, right? In JavaScript, you've created a new method on the fly. We'll use that to our advantage. So part of what we need to do is we need to let go of our Java expectations. I'm not saying Java is a bad language. It's not. I still consider myself a Java developer. But if you come to JavaScript expecting it to be like Java, you'll be very disappointed. If you come to JavaScript with a whole new set of expectations, saying this is a dynamic, prototype-based application. There really are no classes in JavaScript. There are only hash maps. You start saying, oh, I understand what hash maps are. Wonderful. If we set our expectations correctly, I think you'll find you don't hate JavaScript. You just had the wrong set of expectations as we were coming in. Do you trust me on this? All right. Consider this, that after uh, several hours, two to three hours together, at the end of this talk, you might still hate JavaScript. And that's OK. It really is. You know, I have a lot of respect for Ruby, the programming language. I don't like it, but I have a lot of respect for it. I really do. Some of the smartest people in our industry, the Dave Thomases of the world, the Mike Clarks, the Stuart Holloways, uh, these folks are all Ruby developers. It's OK that there are languages out there that I don't like. I respect the language. I respect the people who use the language. With JavaScript, though, if we're going to be web developers, once again, We need to accept that that is the language, the one language that is going to be available across all browsers. So we get to decide if we don't want to be web developers, 
We can be server-side developers. We can be desktop developers. We can do those kinds of things. But that is part of what helps me let go about JavaScript as well, is the fact that it is the language. There are no plans to add additional scripting languages to the browser. There just aren't. And so if we're going to be client-side web developers, we say we're going to accept JavaScript with its flaws and its strengths and just accept that this is the language we'll be using. Is that fair? Yeah? OK. So my goal here today is to not only introduce us to JSON and JavaScript at the local level. That's how we're going to start. We're going to start with a very simple hello world type example. But we'll begin exploring all the different facets of JavaScript. We'll start exploring what it looks like to call JavaScript from your own servers. We'll start looking at JavaScript from other servers. We'll explore cross-site scripting issues. We're going to explore this in a variety of different ways. We'll start very simple, but I promise you it won't be toy examples. If I have a reasonable internet connection, we'll start going out and making Ajax calls to Twitter or to Yahoo or to a variety of different places and try to show you some very real-world examples of it. So that's my goal. I have a bunch of slides. These slides will be available to you right here. But part of what we'll do as well is we'll be fairly flexible and see what direction we choose to take. But to begin with, JSON, JavaScript object notation. How many of you in here work with XML? Ah, very good. Do you like it? Yes, no, yes, maybe, yeah, that's OK. But XML is one, uh, 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 one way of representing our information in a very uh, non-specific way. There's nothing in XML that ties you to .NET. There's nothing in XML that ties you to Java or any of these other languages. It's not the only format out there. What are some other data formats that you work with that aren't language specific? Do you know you deal with plain text files? Do you deal with comma separated values? Yes. Do you deal with SQL queries? Of course, yeah. There are lots of different ways to represent this information. XML is a very popular one. But what we find is XML may not be perfect if you are trying to do in-browser manipulation. It is possible. But in Java, I very rarely deal with the raw XML. I'll deal with a library. I'll deal with dom for j or jdom or caster or any one of these libraries. It's very easy to bring in external libraries as a Java developer because all of our code is local right here. And so if I want to bring in jdom, I just drag the jar over. Ah, and there we go. Yeah. With the browser, it's a little bit different, though, isn't it? Because we're separated. All of the processing goes down on the client side. And I don't get to decide what the client has. If I want to include a JavaScript library, I have to realize that that will be downloaded to the client side you know, along those kinds of lines. And so we can do DOM manipulation of XML. But if we were trying to do something like SOAP, there's no native support in JavaScript for SOAP. So we will almost certainly have to download some library to the client side to manage that. So XML is one way we could pass this information down. But a lot of people started saying, hey, you know what? JavaScript can deal with JavaScript objects very easily. So why don't we just start passing down JavaScript instead of XML? Eliminate that need to parse XML entirely and just deal with native JavaScript objects. In Java, we don't think twice about working with an array list, do we? An array list is a natural part of the library. We don't think twice of dealing with hash maps. Hash maps are a natural part of the library. As a matter of fact, so much of what we do, hibernate an object relational mapper. The name is very apt, isn't it? Rather than dealing with JDBC result sets, we take JDBC result sets and we allow hibernate to transform them into array lists of objects. It's very natural. If you've used JAXB, yeah? JAXB is part of the library. It allows you to take XML and transform it into native Java 
objects. We do this an awful lot as Java developers without even thinking about it. We take whatever that foreign process is and translate it into native Java objects so it's very natural and easy to work with. That is what JSON is. JavaScript object notation means we are going to be dealing with native JavaScript objects. They will be lists and hash maps. But it's a very natural way to do this. And what we find is that JSON brings us a lot of benefits. First of all, it's very light on the wire. We'll demonstrate this. XML can be very verbose. Verbosity is good in certain situations. But when we know it's always going to be transported and always be transported over what's potentially a very narrow pipeline, the verbosity can work against us. If we're in a LAN environment, if I have a server here and a server here, and it's on gigabit Ethernet, the difference between JSON and XML is negligible. But if I have a very tight pipe and I'm going down to a client remotely, the weight of the protocol on the wire becomes very important to me. So JavaScript object notation tends to be very light on the wire. It tends to be native in the language that's guaranteed to be there on all of our browsers. So these are the benefits of JSON. I'm not saying that I use JSON in every one of my solutions. That's called the golden hammer solution, right? That there is only one solution that I will force the rest of the world to conform to my solution. Have you heard the joke that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Yeah? My wife was, when we bought a new house, she was hanging new curtains in a bedroom. And so she was dealing with a screwdriver, and she was manually screwing these screws, and she was having a hard time. I said, no, no, honey, let me get you a better tool. I have an electric screwdriver. And so she was able to zzz, zzz, you know, screw those, those screws in very, very nicely. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you. Go about your business. We were moving in, so I was doing other things. She was hanging these things. And for a while, I heard zzz, zzz, not good, zzz, zzz. And then after a while, I began hearing this. That's not a good sound to hear, is it? What was she doing? She was taking the end of the electric screwdriver and pounding the screws into the wall. She said, this is much easier. I said, no, no, no. XML is a very good format. But if we force everyone to consume XML, even if it's not the right tool for the job, we are falling trapped to that golden hammer solution. JavaScript object notation is perfect if you know that the browser is going to be ultimately consuming. And I will show you at the end of this uh, presentation that there are Java libraries that make it very easy to take JSON and transform them into native Java objects. And of course, they can go from Java objects to JSON as well. But I typically don't consume JSON as a Java developer. As a Java developer and as a Groovy developer, I tend to like XML. If I'm using Java or Groovy, I would prefer to consume it as XML. If I am doing my browser development, I would prefer to consume it as JSON. And luckily, many of the web services out there give me that choice. They allow me to choose the right tool for the job. Yeah? OK, good. This gentleman, Douglas Crockford, can you see he and I shop at the same tailor? Yes, yes. Douglas Crockford didn't invent JSON because he didn't invent JavaScript. Brendan Eichmann is the inventor of JavaScript. He was a Netscape employee. He's still actively working on it today. Douglas Crockford popularized this notion of, hey, if I'm in a browser and I'm going to be using JavaScript, and I already understand what hash maps and arrays are. Why don't I go ahead and just begin passing this information down in a format that's easy for me to consume? And so it's so simple. But he is the one that kind of coined this phrase JSON, JavaScript object notation. He's the one that popularized it. He's working for Yahoo right now, as a matter of fact. And so this is how he describes JSON. It's a lightweight data, inter data interchange format. OK, we've already established that, XML and JSON and things like that. Wonderful. It's easy for humans to read and write. I will leave that up to you. 
But if you're comfortable with name value pairs, name colon value, name colon value, if I'm going to be handwriting Jason, I actually prefer to handwrite Jason over XML. XML is more verbose. I feel like I have to type the same thing in several times. So I do find it easier for me to read JSON that is XML. But I'll leave that up to you to decide. He says it's easy for machines to parse and generate. OK. I'll show you how easy it is. In Grails, we can say, render this list as JSON. I'll give you Java libraries that say, take this array list, render it as JSON. So yeah, we can do this. JSON is a text format that is completely language independent. Java script object notation is completely language independent? In fact, it is. What he means by that is that there is nothing, it's not my cell phone, um, there is nothing that actually ties us in particular to JSON. We'll find that you can consume JSON in Java, you can consume it in Ruby, you can consume it in Python, you can do it. There are libraries for almost every language out there that allows you to do it. That's what he means. When he says it's completely language independent, he says that even though it is JavaScript object notation, we will be able to consume it in a variety of different languages. So this is what Douglas Crockford says JSON is. He says that JSON is built on two structures, simple name value pairs. We call them hash maps as Java developers. But in fact, in JavaScript, we would call them simply objects. Now, I'm making this very important because as a Java developer, you think, OK, object, wonderful. We have single parent inheritance, so I have a Java lang um, uh, array list, and I can extend Java lang array list, and I can do these different things like that. In JavaScript, it doesn't mean that. There are no object hierarchies. All objects are our simple name value pairs. So even though you'll see it referred to as objects in the literature, I still refer to them as hash maps, because that is the proper mental model for me. So anytime I see objects, I'll simply consider them hash maps. I will have a JSON object that has a name and an address and a city and a state and a zip. And that's wonderful. That's all it is. And if I want to have many of those, whether they, we call them people or employees or family members or students or whatever we want to call them, if we want to have a list of these, we'll call it a list. In JavaScript, technically, it's an array. But we can think of it most easily as an array list or a list in Java. So all I'm going to be dealing with here are hash maps and lists, lists and hash maps. That's it. Incredibly simple. This is what an object looks like. You'll see it's going to be wrapped in curly braces. I know this is very small. I apologize. When we live code it, you'll see it. But all we're dealing with are curly braces, name, colon, value, name, colon, value, name, colon, value, comma delimited lists of name, colon, values. That's it. That is our object. That is our hash. If you want to have a collection of those, you're going to wrap them in square brackets, and they're going to be comma delimited as well. So anytime you see a square bracket, it is a collection of objects that are wrapped in curly braces. Yeah? Thank you very much. That's all we have to talk about today. You know JavaScript object notation. You are experts. What? No? You don't believe me? I'm stealing a joke from Douglas Crockford. This is how he ends his presentations. I've seen him talk in, in very large conferences. And he says, if you don't understand curly braces and square brackets and colons and commas, I can't help you. That truly is all there is to Jason. Now, if that's all there is to Jason, I wouldn't give you three hours on that. Certainly, the implementations are going to vary, and they come with its own set of challenges. But what I want us to recognize is JSON is incredibly easy to deal with. Don't make it more complex than it really is. I'm going to be doing some live coding right now. I'm going to be using Grails to do this, just because it's my web framework of choice, just because it's got some very easy uh, JSON utilities in here. Don't feel that you need to use Grails. Some of the very early examples, you can deal with just a text editor and a browser. Recognize that you'll be able to do this kind of thing in struts, or seam, 
or wicket or JSF or any other language you're going to be doing, just because I'm going to be using Grails up here doesn't mean that you should feel compelled to use it out there. But if you do want to follow along with these Grails examples, you'll go out to grails.org. You'll download a simple Grails zip or tarball. You'll create a Grails home environment variable, and you'll add Grails home bin to your path. Fair enough? And then this is what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to go in and create a new application. I'm going to call it JSON. This other things that we'll do a little bit later on. But for right now, I'm going to create a simple application. This is what you can end up doing in a simple text file if you would like. So I have some examples in here. Um, let me do this. So I'm going to say Grails create app JSON. Again, all this is going to be doing is scaffolding out a directory structure for me. It's going to give me some format in which to use. I'm going to um, pull that up in a text editor. And in this web app directory, I'm going to create a file called test.html. Nothing I'm doing at this point is Grails specific, so this is something you can experiment with just in a browser and a text editor if you'd like. So in my body, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say my iPod. And I'm going to have an unordered list of songs on my iPod. Okay, I'm a big Beatles fan. And so I'll say one of the songs I have on my iPod is Hello, Goodbye, list item. Another song I have, do you have any favorite Beatles songs? Yellow Submarine, oh, that's one of my favorites as well. One more. Say again. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. I know what you do when you're not at work. Huh? <laughs> All right. This obviously has nothing to do with JavaScript yet, but let's see if I was able to do this much successfully. Looks good. Looks good. Let's now come in and add some JavaScript to the mix. So right in my head section, I'm going to create a script tag. I'm going to do some very simple things. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hmm. Var song equals. And remember, I'm inside of these curly braces right now. I'm beginning to experiment with JSON. I might say that the title of this song is um, Revolution by the artist Beatles. I might have another song on my iPod. Our song two, artist is the Beatles, title is Sergeant Peppers. Yeah? And I might say I don't have just loose songs rattling around on my iPod. I actually have a collection of these songs. So I say var iPod equals square bracket, song, song two. Are you overwhelmed? Or are you underwhelmed by the simplicity of what we're talking about right here? You know, that, 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 that this really is, you know, doing these kinds of things. Now, if I were in Java, I would be saying song s equals new song. I would be saying list dot add, doing these kinds of things. So 
Metaphorically, we're doing exactly what we would do in Java, but in fact, this is JSON right in here. In a hash map, it doesn't matter what order you add the elements. In hash maps, it doesn't matter if sometimes you have a price field and other times you don't. Does that bother you as a Java developer? Me too, just a little bit. But remember, it's OK. It's OK. We're in a very flexible environment. This is perfectly valid. So now, if I wanted to walk through each song on my iPod for int i equals 0, wrong language, aren't I? For var i equals 0, i less than iPod length, i plus plus. Let me just start by saying alert iPod sub i dot total, right? Since this is, in fact, an array of these elements, I'm going to be walking through and pulling out the first element's title and the second element's title and the third and the fourth and so on and so forth. Let's see what happens when I come back to my browser now and I hit refresh. Revolution. Sergeant Peppers, and there we go. Yeah? Now, obviously, when we just have loose JavaScript jangling around, it's going to be run when this web page is refreshed. Quite literally, your browser is going to be loading up these elements. It's going to hit that script and immediately execute, 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 and then begin rendering these kinds of things. So. Very rarely will I just have loose JavaScript floating around. Most times I will say something like function load and wrap these elements in that function. Yeah, nothing happens. That information is in there, but it hasn't run yet. What are some different ways that I could run that load method right now? On load is one way I heard, absolutely. If we wanted to automate this, I could come in here and I could say body on load equals call the load method. Yeah? Have you heard some people say we should take our JavaScript and move it to the bottom of our files? Why do they say that? There are, there are valid reasons for doing that, and there are invalid reasons for doing it. I do move my JavaScript to the bottom, but it depends on why I'm doing it. Why have you heard that we should move our JavaScript to the bottom? You are all absolutely correct. But I, I do want to make sure, because that is a misconception. It's a popular misconception. So I'm not, I'm not making fun of you. But I, I want to make sure that, that we all understand that, that if I take this script right now and I move it to the bottom of my HTML document and remove this on load for just a moment. It would appear that we've achieved what you were hoping to achieve right there, that knowing that the browser reads these things sequentially, it would load all the HTML and then come to the JavaScript and execute those kinds of things. One of the things we have to be very aware of, though, is that it could have read all of this stuff into memory, but not completely rendered it on the screen yet by the time we get down to there. So we're not guaranteed that by the time we hit that closing HTML that we're ready to execute this kind of stuff, which is exactly why we do this on load. This on load does guarantee, this is a life cycle event right here, guarantees that the page is fully loaded before we do this kind of stuff. The reason why it's typically good to move your JavaScript down here is because what you're allowing your browser to do is do all of the UI events early so the page renders very quickly. Because JavaScript is an interpreted language, isn't it? This is not compiled code. So think about that. If every time you had to run your Java project, you had to compile it first, that would make things very, very slow. We'd want to defer that compilation as long as we could. 
So what we do is we typically move JavaScript down there, not to wait until the page loads, but to move the UI events up on the stack so it feels that this is a very responsive web page. Since this method, in our case, is not going to be called until the body loads, that's fine. But we could have methods that aren't going to be called until the user clicks on a button. Yeah, and we'll do that in just a moment here. And so the reason we want to move our JavaScript is not in order to wait for the page to load, but in order to render everything early because that rendering is how the user is going to say, oh, this is a fast website or a slow website. And if we force the browser to compile all that JavaScript before it displayed something to the user on a button they may or may not ever click, everyone loses. Whereas if we render the page as quickly as possible, and then compile it behind the scenes. And if the user never clicks the button, the user never knows. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Gotcha. So I'm going to go ahead and do this on load. Just to finish the solution right here, I'm going to refresh. There's Revolution. There's Sergeant Peppers. But I'm also going to come in here, and rather than having this body on load, I might decide to have an input button that has a value that says load. And on click, we call that load button. Yeah? So if I come back once again now, we can see that snapped up very, very quickly. That's what we want. We have the UI events very high on the stack. Behind the scenes, it's compiled that JavaScript, loaded that up into memory. When I click on load, it will, in fact, go in there and pop Revolution and Sgt. Peppers for me. So far, so good? Outstanding. Good. What I want to do now is I want to not just alert, alert, alert those things. I want to go in and actually I want to reload that bulleted item list on this block of code so I could manipulate it programmatically. I would give it an ID, absolutely. So what I would most likely do is do something like this. Wrap it in a div. You've seen these divs floating around, right? Divs are nothing more than a semantically named division of code. And so what I'm able to do right now by giving it an ID, I'm able to programmatically refer to song list and do whatever I'd like to. You can throw an ID on everything. I could certainly throw an ID on the unordered list. I could throw an ID on individual list items. But we typically wrap these things in divs so we can get our hands on that and kind of manipulate. Have you also seen people use class? It's syntactically valid. What's the difference between using a class and an ID? Yes? You got it right on the nose. Absolutely. That the ID defines a unique element within there. A class can be reused. So if we're dealing with CSS styling, and we might have this list, and this list, and this list, and this list, and we want to apply the same styling to all four lists, we give it a class, and that allows us to reuse it. The ID implies that it's going to be a singleton on the page. And so while I could give it a class, chances are I want that to be unique on the page. And so I'm going to give it an ID of song list. So now, over here, instead of alerting my way into this, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say var song list equals document get element by song list. And I do want to point out to you right now that you, uh, and, and you said, and, and rightly so, that JavaScript can be differently implemented in differently browsers. This code that I'm showing you right here is 100% cross-browser compatible. 
It won't always be this way. I'll begin tapping into a library very quickly to make these things easy. But this code that I'm showing you here right now, document get element by ID, will work in Internet Explorer and Safari and Firefox and Opera and Conqueror and, 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 and. So JavaScript, and I'm going to make up this number. Did you know that 87% of all statistics are made up on the spot? Yeah? But I am going to say, and this is a made-up statistic, but I think it's close. It's the order of magnitude is correct. That about 87% of JavaScript that you write is cross-browser compatible. It's that last 13% that isn't. That's frustrating. But we shouldn't throw out JavaScript because of 13% of the language. We should celebrate that 87% is consistent across browser, and that number continues going up. Someday it'll be 88, and 89, and 92, and 94, and someday maybe 100% doubtful. But this code right here will work the same across all browsers. So I have now gone to this document. I've gotten the element by ID song list. Yeah? I could go into song list right now. And I could say song list equals boo. It's very quick. We aren't going to do this yet. But just to prove to you that I'm going to come in here and reload, and when I click on this load button, boo. Yeah? I have taken that div and the inner HTML, everything in between these two in div tags, I have now replaced with Boo. That's not very realistic. What I would much prefer to do is come down here is say song list equals output. And I will say var output equals, hmm, here's an unordered list. Output plus equals, close up that unordered list. Output plus equals a list item plus iPod title. Do I understand what we're doing here now? We're programmatically building up our HTML. I start the unordered list, I end the unordered list. Inside of my for loop, I build up my list item, list item, list item, list item. And then I set my inner HTML to that constructed HTML. And we're in place. Yeah? So once again, I'm hitting refresh. This is the HTML as it comes down from the server. When I click on load, I'm using JavaScript to programmatically manipulate the DOM, take whatever's inside of that div and replace it with the unordered list that I want. Does that make sense? Yes. When I'm asking you these things, I'm not assuming that you're idiots. I know you're not. You're very smart people. Yeah? But so many times as Java developers, this class all the time, and I'm a Java developer as well. I know that we expect JSON to be much more complicated, and it's really not. And that's the point I'm trying to illustrate here, is that what we're trying to do here is a really nice, simple, elegant solution. And even though the syntax might vary slightly from what we're used to dealing with in Java, I think we can look through this and we can absolutely see the moving parts. And even though I'm going to get more complicated than this, we want to start with this bedrock foundation. Because what we're going to do is nothing more complicated than this. We're going to iteratively make this not get the JSON locally anymore. We'll get it from a localhost server. And then we'll start getting it from external servers. But fundamentally, this right here is JSON Programming 101. Are there any questions about this before we move on? No? No? Yes, please. It's a very good question. Is JSON built into JavaScript? Absolutely. What we are dealing with, JavaScript object notation, is nothing more than hash maps and lists. 
This is native to JavaScript. And so when we're going to confirm, when we're going to transform this into a web service and begin passing it down, all we're doing is we're passing down native JavaScript constructs. If you want to think of it as a Java developer, it would be as if you were serializing an array list of POJOs across the wire. That is absolutely what we're doing here. But rather than serializing a Java util array list, we're serializing a JavaScript array list. Rather than serializing a Java bean, we are serializing a JavaScript hash map but all we are doing is serializing native JavaScript down to a JavaScript client, much as you would do an RMI serialization to a Java client at the other end. Does that make sense? It's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Yes? Yes. It is working, and this is a very good, and, and, and to repeat the question, he's saying sometimes in JSON you will see the keys wrapped in quotes like this. Absolutely, and as a matter of fact, doing this makes it more technically correct than, than what I'm doing right there. I'm taking a known kind of shortcut with the browsers that hash map the keys will technically always be strings. And so I can assume that those things are going to be strings in there. If I am going to do something like this um, in, in my price, if I am going to say um, uh, new release equals true, something like that, I know just because of JSON that new release is a string and true is a Boolean value. Technically, I should probably do something like that. And technically, I probably wouldn't want to do something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. But doing something like this is a shortcut. When I move to Grails and let Grails generate the JSON for me, you'll see it'll send down well-formed JSON. It'll surround all those keys inside of quotes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. The one problem you might run into is if you wanted to do something like this, and I'm not suggesting you should, but if you wanted to say album title equals, you know, foo, whatever like that, that is when you absolutely would be compelled to wrap those things in quotes. But I wouldn't recommend doing that anyway. Yeah? Yeah? Good. So I like doing this because this will be a jumping off point where we could experiment. I wonder what would happen if I came in here and I said, hmm, I wanted to see price on that. Realize what we have now. We have a song that doesn't have a price, and we have a song that does have a price. So if we're able to come in here to our browser right now, refresh and reload, hmm, nothing, nothing. Nothing. All right, here's when some of our debugging tools become very valuable, don't we? I mean, this is when we could come in and start dealing with Firebug and start looking at the scripting console right now. Oops, where's my console at here? I'm showing JavaScript errors. You know, give me a job. I was expecting a JavaScript error out of that. No? Hmm, okay. Isn't that funny? I was hoping for an error, and I didn't get one, and I'm still disappointed. Rats! There was not an error. OK, let's see if I mess things up with my, with my uh, uh, thing right here. Come back in here once again. Refresh. There we go. That's what I was expecting to see. Undefined and night. Oh, you know what I did? I took the quotes off of that name value bar, didn't I? So I was a victim of my own demonstration. So I apologize. I, I, that was self-inflicted. This is what I was expecting to see out of here, undefined in 99. And so we do have to be a little more uh, defensive when we're consuming this, this JSON. Again, as a Java developer, you would say, hey, if I try to call something that doesn't exist, I'll get a compiler error. Well, we're not going to get a compiler error here, so it does force us to be a little more defensive when we're consuming these kinds of things. And so we'd wrap around it. We'd wrap it in an if, wouldn't we? We would say, if price is null, then go off and do something else. We can do these kinds of things. But if we start with a simple example like that, it allows us to explore and experiment and take it in a variety of different directions.
Unidentified, yeah, yeah. No, no, no will not work, but if it equals unidentified, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This one slide right here really is JSON 101 right there. Everything we're going to do is going to add different variations, but this in a nutshell is what we're going to be doing. Good? Okay, excellent. So let's try pulling some JSON now in remotely. And this is why I brought up Grails. And if you don't have Grails, that's fine. You can demonstrate it here. But the idea now is we, we are almost never going to have JSON embedded in the payload of the HTML. The whole point of web service is to begin making remote calls. And so that's what we're going to do right now. I'm choosing to use Grails as my implementation, but you don't have to do that. So I'm going to go in right now in Grails, and I'm going to create a new song, Pogo, plain old groovy object. We'll come into my browser. How is that even running? Oh, you know what I did? I dra Okay, I'm not running Grails. All right, I'm with you now. Okay, so if I come into demo, there we go. There's my JSON. There we go. All right. I was just doing browser rendering. I wasn't calling it from the server at all. I'm going to come in, and I'm going to say, Grails, if you would, please, I'd like to create a domain class named Calm Thirsty Head Song. So we're beginning to get into something that's going to look a little bit more like typical Java development. Um, how many of you were in my Groovy and Grails presentations yesterday? Some oh, very not many at all. Okay, so uh, how many of you have th this is the first time you're ever seeing Groovy right now? Ah, very good. All right, so let me back up for just a moment then. This is not a Groovy and Grails talk, but let me explain to you that Groovy is a language that runs on the Java virtual machine, just like Java does. Java, the language, compiles into bytecode that runs on the Java virtual machine, the JVM. But in fact, there are many languages that compile into bytecode that run on the JVM as well. Sun supports five different languages that do that. They support Java, of course. They support JavaScript. You can run JavaScript on the JVM. It'll compile down to bytecode and run on the JVM. Java supports JRuby, which is a port of the Ruby language to the JVM. It supports Jython, which is a port of the Python language to the JVM. And it supports JavaFX, if you're doing any kind of rich desktop development. All of these are five distinct languages that compile down to bytecode and run on the JVM. Groovy is not supported by Sun. It's a completely third-party uh, open source language. But much like Scala, or Clojure, or Groovy. There are a whole host of languages that are not developed by Sun, but continue to run on the Java platform. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what's especially nice about Groovy is that it still gives you idiomatic Java-like classes. And so when I come in here to come, there's my song class right here. When I come into this song class, Grails, Domain, Com, Thirsty Head, song like this, we begin seeing that I'm in a language that does support data types. I'm not saying var title, var, artist, var price. I'm in a language that supports data types. As a Java developer, if I were to compile this right now using the Groovy compiler and then use Java P, which is a bytecode disassembler, to take a look inside of the, oh, um, yeah, I've got packages, don't I? Um, let me show you. Person.groovy extends Java Lang object. 
And person.groovy, even though it ends up looking like this, class person, string, first name, and last name as we go in there, when I compile it, groovy C person, I can see that I do indeed have getters and setters and all of these kinds of things, right? And so that's part of why I'm speaking at a Java conference, but I feel comfortable talking about Groovy because Groovy is a perfect superset of Java. It really does start out with the Java AST, the Java abstract syntax tree, and layers on its language features on top of it. And so anything you can do in Java, you can also do in Groovy. So the fact that I'm using Groovy here is just a convenience, but these things will continue to work from a Java perspective as well. Ask me one more time, I'm sorry. Is that even in Java? Yes. Can it be compiled straight away into Groovy? So I know the question you're trying to ask, and the answer is absolutely. I can call Java to Groovy, Groovy to Java back and forth. But the proper but, but the proper response is you compile Java to bytecode that runs on the JVM, you compile Groovy that compiles to the same kind of bytecode that runs on there. So it, the, 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 the common language is not Java language or Groovy language, the common language is bytecode. And so you have Java bytecode calling Groovy bytecode? Yes. Can it be compiled to Groovy compiler? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Very good. Very good. So then, um, so I have this song now up here. I am going to turn around. I'm going to create a controller for my song. Come, thirsty head, song controller. And by this one line def scaffold goes true, all I'm saying is Grails, give me a full CRUD application. Give me a full create, retrieve, update, and delete application that I can use. So I'm going to come in here right now. Grails is going to spin up. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. By the way, Grails is used in a lot of mainstream applications. Wired.com is using Grails, Tropicana, Pepsi Cola, LinkedIn, Evite, um, Sky TV is using Grails, getting millions of hits. And, and so this is Java again at the end of the day. But that's not where we're here. We're here talking about JSON, but I just need to have some implementation. So this is the implementation I happen to be using. So if I come in here real quickly and take a look at localhost 9090 JSON, we can see that I now have the ability to come in and create new songs, much like we were doing before. I can come in here and I can say, oh, wonderful, we have Yellow Submarine. That's a 99-cent song by the Beatles. I have Hello Goodbye, that's an 89-cent song by the Beatles, so on and so forth. So I just wanted to say that, yeah, this is our nice HTML representation of this song. But you can see now I have a client-side piece and I have a server-side piece. I happen to be sending HTML back and forth now. But what I want to do is I want to begin sending some raw data back and forth. So what I can do is this. Back here in my song controller, I can import the Grails converters class. And I can say render song.list is JSON. The converters are very nice because I can also say, hey, I want to get this as XML as well. 
But this isn't an XML presentation, is it? This is a JSON presentation. But I wanted to point out to you that the reason I'm bringing Grails into the mix here now is now I can say list as JSON and get those back as JSON. Or I can say list as XML and I can get them back as XML as well. Yeah? Magic. No, no. So the, um, gra uh, the are, are, how is Grails generating the JSON and the XML? Yeah? It's part of the web framework. It's part of the web framework. So Grails as a web framework has native support for JSON and XML. Okay? It's converters that are in this Grails converters type of package, but this is just part of the web framework. At the end of the presentation, I will show you a number of JSON libraries that you can use to take your Java and convert it into JSON. So you can begin doing this kind of thing in Struts or Seam or wherever you are. Right now, I'm more interested in consuming the JSON than producing it, but I will show you how to produce it by the end of the talk. Fair enough? It's a very good question. Now, there's another question over here. No? Yes. in terms of design patterns. Song is the class, but it's also allowing that song to be uh, treated as the DAO as well, the data access object. So it's encapsulating all of that object relational mapping and allowing me to call list or save or delete or any of those kinds of things as well. Is that fair? Um, uh, uh, the question was, this is an implementation of active record. If you're a Ruby on Rails developer, that's actually the implementation. Grails is based on Java, so it's actually using Hibernate under the covers to do this. So it's similar conceptually, but a different implementation. This is using Hibernate to do the object of relational mapping, whereas Ruby would be using active record. Yeah? Very good. The important part of this discussion, though, is that I now can begin getting JSON back. And we begin seeing now that, OK, yellow, submarine, hello, goodbye. This begins looking very much like JSON. There's my square brackets. Here are my curly braces. Here are my name, colon, value, name, colon, value, name, colon, value. And if I actually come in here and take a look at the source, you'll see it is wrapping those all in quote. So this is well-formed JSON as it, as it comes down in there, as, as, as we're coming down and doing it, even if it renders in that more friendly way of doing it. Yeah? Super. So what I've managed to do now is I've managed to set up a server that I can begin making remote calls to to begin pulling down these JSON. So this is the bare minimum of what I did, render song list as JSON, getting this JSON back. How do I tie these two disparate pieces together now? How do I take my HTML and make the remote call and begin managing it that way? Ajax, absolutely. Now, what's interesting is that Ajax, oh yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so I am, I am, I'm painting in broad strokes right now. If we just render as JSON, it'll serialize all of those. It'll use reflection to do that. I could go in and exclude certain fields. There's more I could do to customize it. But again, what I'm doing right now is just passing down the raw bit to those kinds of things. I mentioned this early in the presentation, and, and it's worth mentioning again. Um, this is not a Grails presentation. But this book, Getting Started with Grails, is a free download, a 160-page book that you can download for free as a PDF that talks more about this. I also write an ongoing series of articles for IBM Developer Works called Mastering Grails. I talk about this a number of different times in Mastering Grails, how to render JSON, how to render certain fields, how to do more customized things like that. So I might defer you to Google Mastering Grails JSON and pull up some of those, some of those kinds of articles. Absolutely, yeah. So it's very good questions, absolutely. Um, so coming back to our example now, remember earlier I said 87% of JavaScript works across all browsers? Ajax is part of that 13% that doesn't. Rats! Okay, so JSON 
hash maps and lists are entirely cross-browser compatible. So you know that no matter who is generating the JSON and getting passed down, you know that you will parse it and consume it the same way. But the way you make the AJAX call varies from browser to browser. So, who was the very first browser to support AJAX? IE. IE, we like making fun of Internet Explorer, don't we? Yeah, but this time we have to give credit where credit is due. When Microsoft was trying to come up with a browser version of Explorer, a browser version of Outlook, they said, hmm, we know that in HTML we're doing these very coarse grain request and responses. Every time I type in a URL and press enter, I'm making an HTTP GET request, and it's downloading the entire page, and the browser is rendering it and displaying it. So this is well understood, these coarse-grained macro requests and responses. Wouldn't it be neat if we could do micro requests and responses as well? I still want to make that HTTP request, but rather than refreshing the entire page, I just want to refresh an individual div. And so Internet Explorer came up with the way inside of their browser, inside of their implementation of JavaScript, JScript, they said, we will create a way that you can make this asynchronous JavaScript and XML call, AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, yeah? A way that you can make an asynchronous HTTP request and response, get the response, jam it into a div. And they were doing it in the context of Internet Explorer and, uh, excuse me, not, well, yes, Internet Explorer, but Exchange and Outlook. Because they wanted you to have the entire browser up, but when you clicked on a message, they didn't want to refresh the entire screen. They just wanted to refresh the body of that message. And then when you clicked over here on a different message, they wanted to go out, remotely request just that individual email to come in and replace the contents of that div. So we do have to applaud Microsoft for creating this. And then Netscape Navigator said, that's really neat. We're going to implement it in a slightly different way. And then all the browsers did. So what's happened now is that Internet Explorer continues to use kind of an active X form of syntax in order to make these kinds of things. Firefox and Safari, and quite frankly, all the others make these requests in a fairly generic way. But what we tend to do now is we tend to rely on libraries to abstract away those differences. And so these JavaScript libraries, I'm going to give you a prototype example here, only because prototype ships natively with Grails. That's the whole reason I'm doing this. But I will show you examples later in the slide deck of how Yahoo does this through the YUI protocol. We can look at how jQuery does these kinds of things. Bear in mind that all of these libraries are meant to just abstract away that last 13% of the browser differences as we go along. The fact that I'm showing you prototype here right now is just one way to allow me to make a single call that will work on both Internet Explorer and Firefox. But it's not the only one. Does that make sense? Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. So here we go. What I'm going to do is this. I am going to copy and paste, because all good developers do that, don't they? <laughs> yes. I'm going to come right back into test. I'm going to do this. So here's my old load method. I'm going to comment it out. Take a look at what our new load method looks like. Now this URL that I'm using, will in fact be that. So I'm just going to go ahead and make that remote URL call. This is a specific groovy way that I can go in and say I'm looking for the song controller and the action list JSON. But all it is is a convenience method that allows me to create a URL like that. So I'll leave that out, one less moving part that we need to concern ourselves with. This AJAX request is prototype syntax. 
It's going to make a request to this URL that I just defined. The method is going to be get. What are the other HTTP methods I could use? What else? Yes, delete, head, options, all a number of other ones like that. But yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be making HTTP get request in here. Asynchronous, true or false, we're going to say true. On success, I am going to pass that request to the update list method. Yeah? So realize that what this request contains now is that JSON payload. So rather than hand coding the JSON payload that I did earlier, like that, yeah, I'm going to be getting it down from the server. And so this Ajax request, is going to be making a GET request to that URL. It's going to pass the response text to the update list method. Yep. On failure, I'll just do an alert saying, hey, this is what's going on. I could log it. I could do whatever I wanted at this point. So we can see now that I've got two different methods. I've got my load method, and I've got my update list method. You're not required to do this, but idiomatically, this is what I tend to do in all my JSON work. I tend to have one method that makes the call. I have another method that renders it, because what that allows me to do is mock out that call for testing purposes. What that means is update list. I can turn around and pass in hand-coded JSON. I can do that in a unit testing and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't couple me to actually having a live server on the other end generating those kinds of JSON things. So that's why I have refactored these into two separate methods. You could continue to do it in one monolithic method. It would just be harder to test when you get it into production. Yeah? So this doesn't look a whole lot different than what we did before. This out probably shouldn't be songs on my iPod. This out should be Where is it? Ah, I copied things under here. Song list. So I am getting that tag just as I did before, and I'm building out these things. I'm using more prototype to do this kind of stuff if I wanted to. But let's see how this much works now. So I have a load method. Ah, there's one more thing I want to do before I get started, and that's make sure I include the prototype library. A little bit here. Converting from HTML to GSP just so I can begin taking advantage of some of the native tag libraries. All right, so let's see how things go now with test2.gsp. I continue to have a button that I'm going to use to call the load method. This load method is going to remote out to this URL, make the request on success pass the response text into update list. Update list is going to fill in the results. Test 2.gsp. Yeah? And again, just to prove that this stuff is doing what we expected it to do, I will go back to my live server, and I will come in here, and I will add a whole new song. I will add um, uh, what's a good Beatles song? While my guitar gently weeps is a 79 song, cent song by the Beatles. There we go. I'm sure that I have three songs in my Beatles list right now. 
I'll come back in here and do a refresh. We know that this much is local, but when I do my load, I get those kinds of things. Yeah? So, we've taken one more step, which is remoting out this call. As I said later in the presentation, we'll take a look at the YUI, we can take a look at jQuery, we can take a look at all these kinds of things. But the important thing for us to realize is not get to bog down in syntax, but realize that that JSON is now being serialized over the wire and I'm still turning around and building my HTML DOM like I would otherwise. Does that make sense? Good, good. Yes, please. It's eval, that's a very good question. So this eval, and we'll see that some libraries will require us to do it and some libraries don't. In this kind of very bare bones example, what I'm doing is I have to use that to actually materialize the JSON. What I actually have to do is execute it. We're going to talk an awful lot more about this. This is executable code. We like thinking of JSON as simple data structures, but in fact it is executable code that comes down. And so what we have to do is evaluate or execute that code in order to create that list of objects so we can begin using them. This could be potentially dangerous though if someone sent down code that would actually execute on this. So I'm going to show you ways around that. This is a naive implementation, but the naive implementation is enough for us to get started. There's some things we can do to make sure that if someone does send down code, it won't execute, that we will strip out all the executable bits and just treat it as pure data. We're sitting at JavaScript 1.7 right now, ECMAScript 1.7. There are talks about ECMAScript 2.0. And when 2.0 comes out, what they're going to do is take this, which is part of the 13% of the, of the exception in here, and bring it back into the native language. They're going to standardize it, and they're going to make it a way that JSON, you'll be able to make safe calls, and it will strip out all executable code and make sure that's going on. So in JavaScript 2.0, it will eliminate the need for us to have prototype and jQuery and Dojo and Scriptaculous for AJAX calls. They will bring that into the libraries in a standardized way. In the meantime, though, it'll be another 12 years before we see that. And so in the meantime, we'll want to continue to use one of these third-party libraries to do that. But there are steps towards making this more standardized, a more inclusive part of the language. Yes? Yes. Yes. I'm going to answer the question I think you asked. You let me know if I answer, am I answering the question that you are indeed asking, okay? I think what you were saying is that let's say up here in our controller, we happen to be passing down JSON, we happen to be passing down XML, maybe I wanted to pass down something like this. Just pass down raw HTML. I'll move that up on the screen so you can see it. Is this what you're asking? Mm-hmm. So what you would want to do is either this or that, but not conflate the two. So if I wanted to, I could come down here. One of the groovy language features is I can wrap things in triple quotes, and this will allow me to have a multi-line string. So this is still a string. So I just want to let you know I'm stretching this out, but it's still truly a Java Lang string. But it's going to allow me to do this kind of thing, unordered list list item, um, we'll come in here and we will say uh, 
This is terrible. I'm running out of Beatles songs to think of. I love the Beatles. There are all kinds of Beatles songs out there. What's another Beatles song we haven't listed out yet? All My Love. All right. And I Want to Hold Your Hand. All right. So this is perfectly valid to turn around and pass down well-formed HTML. I could make my remote request. I could turn around, dump that right into the middle of the div, and then boom, I'm done. The one thing we have to realize is we are now coupling ourselves to a browser that needs to deal with HTML. So chances are you would never embed JSON right in the middle of something like this. If we pass down JSON or XML, this is passing down pure model, no view. And so if we're passing down raw data, it's up to us to eval the JSON, walk through it, wrap it in HTML client side. But there are a lot of places that just do this. They do all the HTML servers. This will be the absolute fastest you can possibly do is just send down HTML right to the browser. The browser will grab it, put it right in the middle of that stuff. No processing, nothing done. But you are coupling yourself to a browser there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we, maybe what we can do is we, maybe we can talk about this a bit over the break. I'm, I'm having a hard time wondering why I would do that, right? And, and so I, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm just not understanding the requirements. Yeah, yeah, because it, you know, in mind, and so just to just to kind of to wrap this up real quickly here, if I were to come back down into my GS page, GSP page right here, I will name this load HTML, and in this load HTML, my URL will be test, yeah? And just to make sure that I haven't made any big errors, so there we go. So we can see that that's just passing down that new div directly. So if I made that call, that request to test, and I passed it into update div, it would end up looking like this. I would say var song list equals Right? I would just take that HTML and drop it right into the middle of that div unchanged, rather than walking through each element in that list and pulling out the title and all that. I would come in and take that raw HTML and just pass it in. And so just to complete this example, Load HTML. Is that what I named it? Yes. So I now have two buttons. One of these buttons is having to parse the raw JSON. The other one is just dropping down the raw HTML.
So we can see as far as the end user is concerned, they don't see any different. But we have to understand that behind the scenes, if you're passing down JSON, it's up to JavaScript to go in and parse that raw data out and generate the view, whereas something like this is incredibly simple. We would just, we would just pass that pre-digested HTML right into the DOM. Did that answer your question? It did? OK, OK. Outstanding. Um, we are about, what, 20 minutes, I think, away from our, after, from our morning break, a coffee so far. So this is good. We are right on schedule. This is where I wanted to be right now. We can see now that we're beginning to have browser client-side behavior. We're beginning to have server-side behavior. We're beginning to use, in this example, prototype to make that Ajax request. But all we are doing is getting that payload and passing it down to some kind of things. And you can see idiomatically, I still separated that out into two separate methods, the request method and the render method or the upload method till we do, till we do these kinds of things. So we've got a good kind of body of knowledge working right now. Let's take the next step. Isn't this how we do it with programmers? We get something working and we're never happy with it. We need to make it more complicated and more complicated and more complicated. But that's what we're going to do right here. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm going to give you a Java example. So I could have a person object that has string, name, and an address that is of type address, right? And then that address would have a string that's a street and a city and a state and a zip and, and, and those kinds of things. We can do that nesting inside of JavaScript as well. So it would look nothing more than like this. Var person equals name Scott, last name Davis, address. Street, one, two, three, Main Street, city, say Colorado. Now, programmers are very poor people, right? So we only have one address, one home. But if I was fabulously rich and I had multiple addresses, yeah, I could turn around and say this. Address is, is, ah, here's my home address, comma, here is my vacation address, right, here is my other vacation address, and I can dream, don't laugh. Yeah, but we can begin seeing that we can arbitrarily nest these things to any, any particular desk. So it's an outstanding question. But yeah, we take those fundamental principles of object and list, and we begin nesting them appropriately. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm so glad you're engaged and asking good questions. It makes my job easier when you're paying attention. So. We started with simple JSON all inside of HTML. We figured out how we could render it using inner HTML and put it inside of a named div. Then we said, I want to separate these two concerns. I want to have a server that's sending me down JSON so I can use prototype to put it inside of that div. But what I did for you here was a little bit of a sneaky trick as well because everything is on the same system. We don't have to worry about XSS. What's XSS? Cross-site scripting, exactly. So this is the next level of complexity that we need to add to the problem. It's not insurmountable, not by any stretch of the imagination, but it is something we need to be able to address. So 
Let's suppose that I wanted to go off and begin making a remote request. I'm going to use Yahoo as an example here. We could use Twitter. We could use any number of things. If I wanted to have my application consume Yahoo search results, the easiest thing for me to do is to hand my groovy code off to Yahoo and ask them if they would run it on their servers on my behalf. What are the chances of that happening? Almost zero. Hey, Douglas Crockford. Yeah, Scott Davis. Scott Davis. Yeah, I'm Scott Davis. Yeah, no, he doesn't know who I am. He's not going to run my code on his servers. So what we have to do is we need to find a way that Yahoo can have their results on their server. I can have my server over here and my client. Oh, we went from one thing to two things to now three things that we need to coordinate and get running. The good news is Yahoo allows me to make requests for their search results in JSON. So if Yahoo gives me JSON, my server can then turn around and hand it back down to the client. Now that's how I'm going to start with three elements in there, but very quickly I'm going to show you how you can go from this client directly to Yahoo without having to have your server in the middle. Both are valid ways to accomplish this, but we're going to start with three because it's slightly easier, and then we will go directly to two. But this is what this request would look like in Yahoo. In this request, I am searching for foo, and I have to have an application ID, and I'm asking them to give it back to me in XML. And we can see we get a Y search response that has a result set web, that has a result that goes in and gets these things out. So this is well-formed XML nested as we go along in here. This is the same result in JSON. And so what I really want to emphasize to us here is we're used to thinking of things in terms of XML. XML is one way of laying out these responses. But JSON can represent all of those same things as well. When I come in here to XML and I see Y search response, response code equals 200. Y search response is an element. Response code is an attribute. Yeah? This is how it ends up being represented in JSON. Yeah. When I come in here and I have a next page that has body right inside of it, that is how next page would end up looking like that. Of course, I cut out the guts for readability purposes. When I have a result set web that's going to have a result and a result and a result inside of it, I will have a result set web that will have a result and a result and a result set inside of it. So don't think that we lose any fidelity at all by transforming from XML to JSON. I'm not trying to argue that one is better than the other, by the way. I end up using both. As a programmer, you have to use whatever people are consuming. But remember how we started this discussion. We said that JSON is lighter on the wire. When we have a next page and a next page like that, every byte going down the wire is a byte that the client has to re re request. When we have a response code like this, this is much lighter. Yeah? When I have a result set web, and a result, and a result, and a result, and an abstract, and an abstract, and a clicker and a clicker and all those kinds of things, we can see that it's perfect for clarity, but maybe heavier than we might need on the wire. Yeah? So JSON takes this name colon value, name colon value approach to be lighter on the wire. Yeah? Yes? That's what I'm going to demonstrate right now. We will be able to do that. I'm going to start with a simple example that my HTML will be talking to my Grail server, which will make the call to Yahoo on my behalf. 
So that's the next path that I'm going to do. That's the next path I'm going to live demo for you. And I am a little bit concerned because my internet connectivity has been a little bit shaky here. I'm hoping that I will be able to live demo this kind of thing for you. But yes, the, the, what, what I'll do next is I will make a request to my Grails app running on my machine right here, which will make a remote request out to Yahoo or Twitter or something like that and return those results. But what I will do after I demonstrate that to you is show you how I will be able to make a call from my local browser directly to Yahoo or directly to Twitter or directly some things like that. It's entirely possible to do that. So um, well, I'll show you both methods. Yeah? Very good. Very good. Yes? This is a very good question. Is there any form of XML validation at all? Um, no. What you will do is you will eval the JSON, and either it will execute as well-formed JSON, or it won't. Ah, schema validation. OK, now I'm with you on there. OK, this is the type of question a Java programmer would ask, right? Because Java programmers expect me to say, when I have a person, a person will always have a name and an address and all those kinds of things. So XML schema says, XML, I have a very rigid schema in here. Remember the JSON that I gave you earlier, that one song had a price and the other one didn't? So there is no notion of JSON validation whatsoever. It's a very free-flowing format. So what I guarantee, what, 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 what my assumption is, is when Yahoo says, this is what my JSON results will look like. I will take them at their word and say that will be the, 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 the case. When Twitter says my JSON results will have these fields in there, I will assume that those, those fields are going to be there. There's no way of validating JSON because JSON is simply a hash map. It can be syntactically correct, but there's no way to guarantee that JSON is semantically correct because, in fact, it is just an array of hash maps. Yeah? It's OK. It's OK. Okay. Yeah, so that is definitely, if you wanted to make sure that XML is well formed, you would end up using XML with JSON. We just get the results. Yeah. Yes, sir. Ask me again. Uh, how, do you, how do you escape a special character in JSON? Um, I don't think you need to. We can demonstrate this, but the only characters that are native to JSON are square brackets, curly braces, colons, and commas. And I think that if we wrap them in quotes, it's just going to treat them as any of those kinds of things. So we can experiment with that kind of stuff. But I, I mean, it's, it's an excellent question, and I had to think for a moment. I've never had a need to escape those things, because in the payload, it's typically a string, which is anything you want to have in it. Ah, uh, double quotes inside of your double quotes. I would imagine it's a backslash. We can, we can verify that, that that is the case, but I would, I would almost guarantee that it's a backslash. Yeah? Yes? The, the, the question is, do these uh, service providers change their schema too frequently? No, and as a matter of fact, I am playing the mad professor. There we go, I lost my clicker. As a matter of fact, when I make this request, I see version 1 right in the URL. If we're, we're, when, we're, when we're beginning to think about RESTful URIs, it's very typical for us to have a version number right in there. And so if Yahoo changed the output, I would expect them to change that v to a v2 or a v3 or, or, or something like that. And so when they publish this interface, um, I have never come across an application that changed the output mid-version. Um, when I'm using Google Maps, and I have that version 1, version 2, version 3 embedded right in the URL, when I'm using Twitter or I'm using these things, they will almost always have that version number in there. And so, yeah, I've never had it happen to me in practice. It could, yeah, but in practice, most people are, are fairly responsive about that. Yes, please. The question is, you didn't ask your question long enough. I was still drinking. I apologize. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, your, um, your question was, do I prefer using JSON or XML with XSLT? Yeah? Um, I tend to prefer JSON, yeah? But that's my personal preference. 
if you were going to be using an XSLT type solution, it would be a third way of doing what I demonstrated to you before. Right now we're passing down JSON from the server and I'm doing a local client side transform. Or I could pass down raw HTML and just dump it right into the div. I would personally probably prefer using one or the two of those kinds of things. But I do know other people that pass down XML to a browser and do a transform in the browser. The reason I don't perform, prefer that is because, and I could be speaking out of turn here, but I think that Internet Explorer does it slightly differently than Firefox. Yeah, so you're in those kinds of things. So having a JSON or raw HTML would give me more cross-browser fidelity than doing an XSLT transform. There are lots of people who do that kind of thing. Um, I was doing some consulting for um, MTV, actually, MTV.com, and their whole website is exactly as you prefer. They, you know, they, they, they pass down XML and it does a transform and another transform and another transform and another transform and does that, and that is a valid solution, but I find it's less typical. Excellent. Okay. So getting back to what we're, okay, so what I, what I wanted to um, uh, impress to us here is that we're not losing any data fidelity at all in terms of translating between XML and JSON. We are able to represent these things. Based on your questions, I can't do validation on this. I will grant you that, absolutely. I can't do namespaces on this. I will grant you that. I mean, if you want to do those kinds of things, you are going to want to do XML. But in terms of just a raw data transport back and forth, I can represent everything I would normally represent in XML, and I represent it in a slightly lighter way on, on the wire. So I'm not arguing better or worse. I'm just stating, stating the facts out of that. So this cross-site scripting issue, that we're going to run into. And I'll only be able to briefly introduce this before we go to break, but we'll discuss it in much greater detail after the fact. Is truly a security feature. I am glad that they have this um, in place. Because the web allows us to pull in resources from a variety of different servers. I can have an HTML page that pulls in an image from Flickr and pulls in a video from YouTube and pulls in CSS from here, and pulls in a variety of different resources from a variety of different places. When these are display-only resources, I don't care. It's actually a benefit. There's a wonderful book out there called Small Pieces Loosely Joined by David Weinberger, Small Pieces Loosely Joined. And he is describing the web. He says, metaphorically, the World Wide Web is nothing more than small pieces loosely joined. An image from here, a movie from here, MP3 from here, gathered together in HTML. It's wonderful. There is no danger in doing that because none of those are executable elements. There is no danger. I might display an offensive image, yes, but it won't hurt me. It won't hurt my browser. It won't steal my results or anything like that. JavaScript is executable code. There is danger. I'm not trying to fill you full of fear right before I send you to break. Jason is very dangerous. No, 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 that's not what I'm trying to say at all. But since Jason is executable code, that is the exception to this rule. And this cross-site scripting is because JavaScript is executable, not a read-only resource, but an executable resource. And so we do need to treat this slightly differently than all the other resources. When we get back from break, we will explore what cross-site scripting means and some workarounds. And you already know the answer. The workarounds are either to call your server and then the external server or to call that resource directly from your browser. But both of these are directly related to this cross-site scripting, and we will explore both strategies after our break. I believe we're taking 15 minutes. Is that correct? 20 minutes. Yes, so we will reconvene again at 10.20. Have a wonderful break. Thank you so much for your question and your attention this morning. This is good. I have as many people as I started with before the break. That's a good sign. Does that mean you're enjoying yourself? Yes. Oh, very good. <laughs> Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. I do appreciate that. It's so good when you enjoy what you do. And you can be excited about the technology you're speaking. And I think you can tell that I'm excited about uh, Groovy and Grail, certainly, but, but Ajax and, and Jason as well. 
Um, it is not a perfect technology, and I hope that you're getting that, that from me, that, that this is certainly a technology that has strengths and weaknesses. But the way I started this presentation is the way I want to emphasize here as well, that JavaScript, warts and all, is the technology we have available to us. And so we can either get frustrated by its limitations or celebrate its capabilities. And so I've definitely chosen to celebrate its capabilities. Now in that spirit, I don't appear to have network connectivity up here, which is going to make this next hour um, difficult to demonstrate. And I do apologize about that. You will have to just take me at my word, and I do apologize, but you will have to take me at my word that once we start going out to Twitter or Yahoo or these kinds of things, this technology will work as well. Unfortunately, I will not be able to live demo it for you because, again, I don't have an internet connect connection up here. But this technology is tried and true. And I have lots of screenshots. And so hopefully we'll be able to get the uh, impression of, of, of what's going on if we aren't able to actually live demo this stuff. Fair enough? Yes. So we started this morning with a single HTML file. We moved very quickly from an HTML file to a localhost server. But the reality is now we want to add a third server to the mix, be it Yahoo or Twitter or Flickr or YouTube or any of these kinds of things. And remember we said in the spirit of small pieces loosely joined, the web allows us to make an image source call out to Flickr and include it in our web page. It allows us to download applets and download flash players and download YouTube videos and all kinds of things. And it's okay to include these remote resources in our page because they aren't executable. They aren't going to do any damage. We can just as easily include JavaScript. Our script source can remotely load JavaScript. The difference here is this is executable code, so we need to treat this a little bit differently. But we are still able to do these same kinds of things. Cross-site scripting. Let me give you a theoretical example. When I go to Amazon.com in my browser, I type in Amazon.com, and I am searching for books, I know that I'm communicating with Amazon.com server. I know I'm making HTTP GET requests and POST requests, post requests and puts and deletes. And I know they might have JavaScript that's validating my credit card number and all kinds of things, but I feel fairly confident that if I'm doing business with Amazon that I am entrusting them with my credit card number and I will get the goods that I request. All of this is from my browser to Amazon.com server back and forth. JavaScript would conceivably allow a rogue script to be running on my browser and as I type in my credit card number, not only make an AJAX request, an asynchronous JavaScript and XML request to Amazon.com, it would also allow that same credit card number to be sent out behind the scenes without me knowing it to HackersRUs.org as well. Yeah, That's a problem. And so JavaScript runs in a sandbox. And what that means is it must operate under the same source policy. And that means that the source that I downloaded the HTML from is the only place that JavaScript can make AJAX requests to as well. So when I download the HTML file from Amazon.com, JavaScript can only make asynchronous requests back to Amazon.com. Same source policy. Does that make sense? I can download images from YouTube and anywhere else, but JavaScript can only make requests back to the source where the HTML file came from for security reasons. So cross-site scripting, that same origin policy right there, is to prevent my credit card number surreptitiously going off to some other website without me knowing about it. So, we have a couple of workarounds here because JSON is JavaScript. Even though it's data, it is JavaScript. And so we have a couple ways we'll be able to work around these things. 
one possible solution would be to digitally sign your JavaScript through VeriSign or any of these things, public key, private key encryption, all that. What you would literally do is jar up your JavaScript. Use a Java jar, a Java archive to jar up your executable JavaScript. You would digitally sign it, and when that downloaded to your browser, the browser would say, you have executable code from Amazon.com. Do you trust Amazon? And if you click on yes, you're allowing that code to make calls out to browse to sites other than the same source policy. This sounds good on paper, but the drawback is it only works in one particular browser. Yeah? Internet Explorer doesn't support this. So what we have to do is say, well, theoretically, that's one way we could solve that problem, Gesundheit. Um, we really have two realistic options to allow us to make requests out. We can either create a proxy in our domain, or we can use a callback function. And when we do this callback function, it's going to look like <coughs> a hack. And that's because it is. It is a hack. It is working around these known limitations. But you know what? If Yahoo is doing it, and Google is doing it, and all these well-known companies, it's not a hack anymore, is it? It's a well-known solution. But it is, in fact, a hack. It's a way that you will be able to circumstood work around. And this is how Google Maps works, and this is how Yahoo works, and this is how all major JavaScript folks work. And so I'm not saying it's not without danger, but I am saying that this is well understood and well used by a lot of major players. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. And so when I said when JavaScript 2 comes out, It'll negate the need for us to do this. When JavaScript 2 comes out, ECMAScript 2.0, when it comes out, there will be native support for this kind of thing that will be able to do it in a very safe way. It'll strip out any executable code and just give you raw data. Because once you're getting raw data, you have a read-only resource again. That's the problem, that JavaScript object notation is not only objects, but it is JavaScript as well as executable code. And so we are exposing ourselves to some risks right here. There is no danger in doing this to Google and Yahoo and things like that. But it is well understood that there is a, a potential for risk. And so when ECMAScript 2.0 comes out, they will close that loop and make sure that when you make those cross-site requests for JSON objects, the language itself will strip out any executable bits and make sure you just get raw data representations. Yeah, very good question. So these are the two solutions we're going to spend the next hour exploring. Creating a proxy in our domain that will make that remote request on our behalf, and then we'll explore making the remote request directly from the browser. So the way this proxy works is again very simple. If you're expecting a complicated solution, don't worry, I'll give you one next. But this is still very, very simple. If the same source origin means I can only call back to the server from whence I retrieved my HTML, then we say, great. Go ahead and make that request back to that server. Yes? Once you're on the server side, that servlet or in my case, Grails controller, is free to do anything it wants. Presumably, since I wrote the HTML and I'm calling back to a server that I trust, that server can retrieve information from a database, it can retrieve information from a file system, or it can go off and make these remote requests on my behalf. So this is something that's used all the time. In this case, we would create a controller that would turn around and make a call out to Yahoo and build up the application ID and say output equals JSON and build up the query and things like that. And then it would return those results. So what we end up seeing is when my user 
makes a request to my server, it downloads the HTML. The AJAX request goes right back to the server from whence it came. And in my case, the server calls out to Yahoo, returns the results back down to the browser. This is the proxy solution. Yeah? It's very simple. And it gets us around this limitation baked into the browser. So mm, this is such a fun example. I'm going to see if I have network connectivity one more time, and I'll be disappointed, I know. Mm. I'm sorry? You have uh, connectivity out in the, in the audience? Let's see here. Turn off my Wi-Fi and turn it back on again. Ah, uh, Airtel? Yes. Do we know what the password is? Zero nine. Here, and I'll even show it. I'm sorry. Oh, 0987654321. How's that for secure, huh? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Did it work? Oh, I hope it does. I hope it does. This is much more fun when we see the live code. Waiting, 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 waiting. It is slow, okay. Waiting, connecting, waiting, connecting. I see connectivity, so I think there is hope for us. Ah, thank you so much. Wonderful, there we go, ah. <sighs> Teaching internet classes without the internet, that's no fun at all. All right. So, it is slow, so we still might get caught. But let's see what this looks like. So if I go out to Twitter.com, and I have noticed people have been Twittering, which is a good thing. Um, we will come in here right now, and we will search. I've been using GIDS, G-I-D-S. I understand other people are using Developer Summit. Yeah? So if I come in here and search for Developer Summit, Summit, Dev Summit, yeah, is that what you're using? Transferring, transferring, transferring. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, we'll see if this comes up. But while we're waiting for this to come up, I wanted to show you that this is the same thing we did earlier in Grails. Remember, we went into Grails, we created a song, I showed you the HTML output, and I said, oh, now I want to get the JSON output and render this locally. I'm hoping what will happen here is that same workflow. The only difference is I will be going out to Twitter. Done. No such luck. All right, let me try it one more time. And if not, I will go straight to the web services call. Let's see if I can get anything. There we go. Hey, hey, and I'm even first on the list. Wonderful. All right. So you can see this is live. Here's Scott Davis, unable to connect to the demo. We know that I didn't, I didn't fake that up, did I? All right. So this is the HTML version of this kind of stuff. Twitter provides me web services as well. They don't provide me SOAP interfaces. Does that disappoint anyone? Nah, I don't miss SOAP either. What they do provide me, though, are a number of different formats. I can get these same results down in XML. Technically, it'll be in the Atom format. Have any of you worked with Atom before? Yeah? Atom is much like RSS. It's well-formed XML. But it has a temporal element associated with it, a time-related element. So presumably when you go out to a blog, you always want to get the most recent blog entry. Atom has that temporal nature associated with it. When I make an Atom request, I'll always get the most latest tweets associated with this. Google 
Now I'm feeling brave. Google has converted all of its web services to the G-Data umbrella. And the G-Data umbrella is not SOAP-based, it's REST-based, but when this comes up, we'll see that it's using Atom as well to get its information. So if you want to interact with your Gmail account or you want to interact with your Google Calendar or you want to interact with Google Docs or you want to interact with any of these kinds of things, they return that information in XML but specifically the Atom format. So flipping back to Twitter now, Twitter supports not only an XML format, it supports a JSON format as well. Waiting, 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 and we'll see what these results look like. Um, they might have added recently. I know that when I interact with them, I almost exclusively use the Atom uh, format. Uh, they might have added JSON recently. I don't, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. We could go back and take a look. Oh, it did have it right there? Okay, I just wasn't reading closely enough. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So here's what our request is going to look like now. HTTP search.twitter.com search.atom as a query which will return well-formed XML. Or I can say, I don't see it on here. They've changed the screen slightly on me. But I can call search.json and get the same results back as JSON. So let's come in here right now and go to search.twitter.com search.atom query equals get. Sees my tweets in the session, yes? There we go. This is the XML representation of this that we'll be able to go in here and we'll be able to get the feed. And each feed has an entry and each entry has a title. Scott Davis sees my tweet in the session. What we can also do is go search.twitter.com, search.json, q equals gids. We'll get the same fidelity back, the same information back, but this time it'll be returned in JavaScript object notation instead of XML. Waiting, 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 waiting. While we're waiting for this, we come back in here real quickly and show you briefly how easy it is to parse this XML output. Here is my URL, HTTP search twitter.com search Adam Gids. If I come in here and I say my feed, parse that address, then I can come in here and do a feed.entry.each, print out the title of this. So I understand that I'm doing the XML right now. Don't think I have forg forgotten that. But I wanted to show you how easy it is to parse the XML and then contrast it with the JSON. So real. Waiting, waiting, waiting. There we go. So we begin seeing that Groovy, and again, I, I understand this isn't JSON. But Groovy makes it very easy for me to navigate that XML. If we go back and look at what that XML looks like, we had a feed that had an entry. I walked through each one of those entries, and I pulled out the title element. Feed, 
entry title. Did I give the JSON search enough to come up? Ah, excellent. So these are the JSON results. Scott Davis sees my tweet in the session once again here. But realize what they've done now is they've given me an object. I can tell that it's a curly brace. That JSON response has something named results in it. And that square bracket tells me I'm going to have a list of results that's going to allow me to come in here and get, in, get out information this way. So let me put a server-side resource in place get these Twitter results as JSON, and see if we can parse them out this way. Fair enough? All right. So to begin with, what I will do is this. I will say, Grails, please create me a controller for Twitter. This is all on my local host right now. There we go. Yeah? What I will turn around and do is this. In these two lines in Groovy, and technically all this is, is defining a string. So in this one liner right there, Groovy is going to take this string, transform it to a URL, make the HTTP GET request, get the results, and render it back to my client. Can you see why I like Groovy and Grail so much? Yeah. So I'm going to start up my local server once again. Grail's run app. Running my Grails application. Super. Localhost 9090 JSON. Waiting, waiting, waiting. But eventually, if I talk long up, we will see results come back up here, JSON results. And we will see that what I am doing is I am using my local server to make a request out and manage these kinds of things. I might still have to move on if I don't get better response times out of this. I will let this grind behind the scenes. But can you see how now that this is the proxy solution right here, that I would have an HTML form that has a search box in it. I would submit those results to my server. My server would make the JSON request and return the results back to me on its behalf. This is perfectly valid. And this is absolutely same source origin. When my search form calls back to my server, my server can proxy out the request on my behalf, return the results. Life is good. Did I get results back? Runtime error. It didn't like. Yep, my network failed once again. Hmm. OK. I think you get the idea, though. I can demonstrate this for you right here, that this would be on my local host server right here. I would type in a value like Beatles, click on the search button, and my server would make that request out to Yahoo on my behalf, render the results, and I would be doing things as I normally do. Yeah? So this is a very easy way for you to deal with JSON. This is a very fail-safe way for you to deal with JSON. And what this allows you to do is start getting JSON resources from any number of places. Um, 
You know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? That's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to expect different results going back to the server. But if you go out to the website Programmable Web, I'm hoping that my connectivity will be back up. ProgrammableWeb.com, ProgrammableWeb.com is a great resource for you. It's a central clearinghouse for all of these major public APIs. You can go to Programmable Web and find links out to the YouTube API and the Twitter API and the Google API and the Yahoo API and on and on like that. And so all of these different public APIs, we could replace any one of these JSON requests and be able to process them in the same way. It's not going to come up, so I'm going to move on. I do apologize. But Programmable Web would allow you to do the same example using Yahoo or Twitter or any of these other kinds of things. You would simply proxy out and return the raw JSON and let your client process it as it normally would. That is the three-step process right there. This is now the two-step process, and it does break cross-site scripting. What I'm going to demonstrate, or at least wave my hands and pretend that it worked, is being right down here in my browser and making that same call directly to Yahoo, bypassing my proxy. This is a hack, but this is how Google does it and Yahoo does it and everyone else. And the way they do this hack is by providing a callback. What this callback does is allows you to specify a method name. And all they will do is wrap those results in the method name that you provide. Remember the eval that you were asking about earlier? Everything? When you, they wrap their results in a method call of your specification, when you eval that, you are literally executing that. You are taking not only the JSON results, but the method name and executing it locally in your browser. When you download the Google Maps API and you're using it in your browser, and you're dragging the map around on your screen, quite literally, it is using this thing. It is saying, hey, I'm going to make these calls directly to Google, and I'm going to wrap it and make requests right down in here. Yahoo and Twitter and everyone else gives us the opportunity to provide a method call that it will wrap those results in. So when we eval, it will do this stuff. So here are the steps that we're doing. We're going to load a new JavaScript file dynamically from a remote server. We're going to have that call an existing method in your code base. So what this would look like is this. I would pass in the application ID. I would ask it to be returned to me in JSON callback. It's another one of those name value pairs. In my case, I would say my callback should be show results. Show results is a method in my body that will process those JSON results and give you the output. Done for. OK. The results would then come back wrapped in these calls. So let me see if I can mock this up for us right now. Since we don't have the network, we will turn around and pretend that this is working. We'll do it back in my song controller. So we'll do this. I will say, first of all, We'll try this. We will come in here.
And here is my song controller. I'll add a few new songs here. I had to reboot, so I lost my things, but no, no problems there. We'll come back in here and say, hello, goodbye, 99 cents. Here are the Beatles. Can I add one more thing? While wow, my guitar gently weeps, 89 cents. There we go. So we can see that this is the HTML representation. We can see that this is the JSON representation. Now this callback example will do nothing more than wrap it in the method that we choose. So when I come in here and call remote example for a moment, callback equals foo, or callback equals bar, or callback equals my local meth, ud, there we go. You know, we can begin seeing that what we're doing is all we're doing is we're saying, all right, what I would like you to do, sir, is take this and wrap the results in that. So I am absolutely mocking this up on my local machine here, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, Callback, um, yeah, so in effect, all I'm doing is wrapping my local method in those JSON results. So when I call once again load, it's wrapping it in a load method. When I'm calling um, display results, it's wrapping in display results. This callback method is supported by Yahoo and by Twitter and by everyone else. Let me see if I can at least pull back the JSON API to show you this. Right there, perfect. Search twitter.com, search.json, callback foo, query results in there. So even though I won't be able to demonstrate this to you live, you'll see this is a well understood way of doing this. All you're saying is please wrap those Twitter results in the method name, the callback name that I've supplied, so I can turn around and eval that, eval that and pass it in. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So this is how Yahoo does it, this is how Google does it, this is how Twitter does it, and everyone else. So what this would end up looking like then is here is our search Yahoo API. And then I would use JavaScript to create a new script element to specify the type and the source, add it to the head, and execute it. So you can see what we're doing here is we're doing DOM manipulation. What we're doing is we're programmatically adding a new JavaScript script to the head of this document, which will in turn execute it, which will in turn render the callback, which will in turn call the method of my choosing as we go along in there. There are a lot of moving parts, and if you don't, if you aren't familiar with JavaScript, I can see how that would be that would be confusing. So this is complex. If you're confused, you're right on target. You should be confused by that. But it is how Google and Yahoo and everyone else are doing these kinds of things. This is using JavaScript to programmatically add JavaScript to the current document. And by using that callback method, the results will be calling a method of your choosing as we go along. Why on earth wouldn't we want to do this all the time? I can hardly wait for ECMAScript 2.0 to come out so we don't have to do these kinds of workarounds. But this is how I could turn around and actually have an HTML form that is calling that remotely, getting those results, and rendering them out. Do I do this kind of thing on purpose? Almost 
Never. I use the proxy solution that I demonstrated to you because it's fewer moving parts, it's easy to understand, because I typically am writing my own website. So it's OK for me to put proxy things in place and proxy those JSON results down. Google doesn't have that luxury. Google says, if you want to use the Google Maps API, I can't ask you to have a server-side resource that'll proxy those results. Google says, you're going to include the Google Maps API right in your HTML, and we're going to use these methods to, pro to, to make those calls back to Google. Yeah? And so this is a more complex solution. If you need to use it, you now have the step-by-steps in order to show you how this stuff works. But if you can use the proxy solution, it's much easier, and I encourage you to do that. Fair enough? Yeah. Good. Good, good, good. So let's address this eval issue in a little bit greater detail. This is potentially opening up some holes. If you're calling Google, you have nothing to worry about. If you're calling Twitter and Yahoo, you have nothing to worry about. But you are taking that with a grain of salt that this will be a problem. So what you might do, and what I typically do, is I will use some library that will provide me an extra layer of security to make sure that nothing bad is going to happen. Remember Douglas Crockford? It's hard to say that he invented JSON, but he popularized this notion. He is now working for Yahoo. He now has a JSON utility available to us to Yahoo that will allow us to safely request this JSON stuff. jQuery and Do JDOM and other, or, uh, excuse me, Dojo and other folks have different ways, but I wanted to demonstrate at least the Yahoo approach to solving this problem. So what we would do is we would make a call out, and I know this faded out a little bit, yui.yahooapis.2.5.0. The version number is directly in the URI right here. Pulling out this Yahoo minifies library, this JSON minified library, to include these elements in your web page. Notice that it's OK that we're remotely requesting these from Yahoo. It's going to download once, execute, and be resident in memory. That's just fine. Then, in order to use it, rather than doing the eval that I did earlier, I would make a call yahoo.lang.json.parse, whatever that result is. All that this method is doing is a regex expression. It is stripping out everything that is not a square bracket, a curly brace, a comma, a colon, or an alphanumeric character, right? So even though I'm not showing you the implementation right here, we can see that it's doing very, very simple things. It's scrubbing out anything that might be executable and just giving you raw data. This is the behavior that will be native to ECMAT 2.scripto, so we won't have to use a third-party library. But for right now, this is the 13% that we need to rely on an extra library to give us a normalized approach. When you're doing these kinds of things, then you can be very, very sure that bad things won't occur, that it will, in fact, just be raw data. Realize that if you do this, can you use the callback method that I just showed you earlier? Yeah. So once again, you can use this method along with the proxy solution. That would be the most secure way you could accomplish this. If you have the server-side resource, you know that you are making the call out to the external URL. If you do this on the client side, you're sure that only pure JSON is being passed down. You are absolutely safe at that point. If you want to do that client directly to Yahoo, directly to Google, you need to either trust that Google and Yahoo or Twitter are not going to pass down executable code or not use that method. These are valid decisions. You can use one or the other. But both have strengths and weaknesses. Yeah? So to continue this Yahoo example, I wanted to show you how prototype allowed us to make an Ajax dot request. The Yahoo library does it in a slightly different way. But once you understand the fundamentals of JSON, once you understand how these things are working, the implementations don't bother you anymore. When you go and you look at code like this, 
So we're including some JSON. We're including a URL. Don't worry, the important stuff is right up here. Document get element by ID. Handle success, do this function. Handle failure, do that function. We saw that already, didn't we? We knew that Ajax, excuse me, prototype, handled it this way, on success, on failure. Yahoo handles it this way. The callback down here, success and failure, I know that's very low. The language isn't important. The important thing is the philosophy is the same. Whether you're using the Yahoo libraries or the prototype libraries or any of these things, we have the same basic workflow, the same basic patterns coming through. The implementations will vary, but once you understand the basic building blocks, it doesn't matter how they're arranged, they all do fundamentally the same kinds of things. Yahoo, util, connect, async, request, get, SURL, callback method right here. This is syntactically different than this, but conceptually identical. The syntax changes slightly. This one I'm using YUI. This one I'm using prototype, but the ideas remain the same. This is the last thing we're going to talk about, consuming JSON and Java. We're moving off of the web tier now. We're going to be talking about consuming from JSON. But before we go here, do you have any questions about prototype or YUI or cross-site scripting or any of the concepts we've talked about up to this point. Yes. You are correct. <sighs> what I showed you is 100% valid JavaScript. There is nothing you can do to disable people from doing exactly what I showed you. I'm not advocating it. I'm just stating the fact. That is the case. That because JavaScript allows you to programmatically manipulate the DOM, that means JavaScript allows you to programmatically add new JavaScript to the thing. It's, it's, it's a, a fact of life when you're a client-side browser JavaScript developer. So um, I, I, it, it just uh, is what it is at this point. And when you hear Douglas Crockford talk about it, he says exactly the same thing. He says, this is just the reality of being a client-side JavaScript developer. There is that known exploit. Um, there's nothing we can do to prevent it. When JavaScript, when ECMAScript 2 comes out, there will be things in place that will allow you not to do those kinds of things. But for right now, it's a known exploit. Google and Yahoo and Twitter allow us to exploit it for good. Other people could exploit it for evil. And, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to clamp that down. It's a good question. I wish I had a better answer. Yeah. Yes, you wanted to see that once again? Yes. Um, I have 10 minutes left. I don't know that I have time to demonstrate it for you here right now, but I will be here after the presentation. If I want to make sure that I do end on time, but anyone who is interested, I will turn around and run this code after the formal presentation so we can see it in action. I'm sorry for doing that to you, but I, but I, I will definitely do it for you after the presentation. Okay? Excellent. In the last 10 minutes, though, I do want to come in here and show you some Java solutions. You will probably not use these Java solutions for consuming JSON as much as you'll use them for producing JSON. I've been using Groovy and Grails to produce that. I've said render list as JSON. 
In Java, you won't have that same capabilities, but these libraries will allow you to do that in only slightly more lines of code. And I'm not being sarcastic. Really, only slightly more. It won't be a one-liner like I had here, but it won't be terrible at all. If we go out to json.org, this is a website maintained by, I'll give you three guesses, Douglas Crockford, exactly, yes, that turns around and lists all of these different libraries. When he says that JavaScript is not language specific, this is what he means. There are JSON libraries for ActionScript, so if you're a Flex developer, you'd use one of these. For C, C++, C Sharp, Cold Fusion, Delphi, Java, the list goes on and on. But the only language I can think of that's missing up here is COBOL. If you're trying to do JSON from COBOL, you're just out of luck. I can't help you there. But otherwise, you're going to have a variety of different libraries. As Java developers, there are a whole bunch of libraries we could choose from. I'm going to give you examples of two. Org.json was created by Douglas Crockford. JSON.lib is another library. So I just give you two examples of how to do this. This example right here is org.json.json writer. And so if you wanted to, I know this is very low on the screen, but you could say new JSON writer dot object, remember an object is in curly braces, dot key dot value dot key dot value dot key dot value, do this kind of stuff. So this is what the code would look like in Java. I would never write that code in a million years though. Because what I would much rather do is be able to turn around and take a Java hash map and transform it to JSON. Or I would rather take an object, like a Java bean, and transform that into JSON. Or a collection of objects and transform this into JSON. So this is the very typical usage pattern that you would use. If you already have a Java bean and you wanted to transform it into JSON, you would pass it into new JSON object and call output, and you'd get JSON output. It would use reflection to do that. If you already had a hash map, you would pass it in. It would use reflection, give you output. Right? So this is a much more realistic usage of these kinds of things. If you wanted to create a JSON array, you would pass in a collection or an object array or a raw string source and manage it that way. So these are the libraries that you can use org.json JSON object and org.json JSON array that would allow you to produce these kinds of things. So can you visualize now on your server that, all right, well, I've got an array list of POJOs. I'll do a one-line transform on this and send it back out. Yeah? So this is one way you could accomplish this. I've used this library quite a bit. At one point, this is what Grails was using under the covers, which is how I originally discovered it. Andres Almire is one of the contributors on this. Um, I believe Grails has changed its implementation, but this is another, another library you can use. As you saw, there were a dozen or so libraries, so I'm giving you two representa uh, representative examples. You don't have to use either one of these, but to give you an idea that once you understand the concepts, the implementation is immaterial. So when we take a look at what JSONlib provides, it would be something like this. You would turn around and create a new hash map, and then you would say JSON object and get results like that. If you had a bean, you would get results out like that. So this is a different library, same result. If you had a Boolean array, array from object, print it out. If you had an array list, JSON array from object, print it out. So this transform from whatever Java objects you have into JSON is quite seamless. If you think about this, hibernate marshals from JDBC result sets into array lists or from array lists into JB, JDBC insert statements. So we have these transform libraries. Have any of you used Castor before, C-A-S-T-O-R? 
Castro.org, it's a brilliant library. It's an XML marshalling library. It works much the same way. You take an array list of POJOs, run it through Castor, it spits out XML. You have XML, it ingests it and gives you well-formed objects in here. These JSON transform libraries are conceptually no different. The only difference is the output is JSON as opposed to XML for JDBC insert statements. And as a matter of fact, what I especially like about JSONlib is, um, Rats, I don't have it um, here for you, but um, what JSONlib provides is those same transforms as well. So JSON accepts CSV values and spits them out as JSON. It accepts XML and spits them out as JSON. And so what I particularly like about the JSONlib is that it provides a wide range of potential inputs that you can, in turn, dump back out as JavaScript object notation. I'm sorry? It's a Java library, not JavaScript anymore. We're in Java. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we've managed to do here, and you get to decide, is JSON simple and human readable? Yes? If you don't agree, that's fine as well. But I do tend to like JSON, reading JSON better than XML. It's less noisy. Everything in JSON is either an object or an array of objects. An object is in curly braces. An array of those are in square brackets. Local JSON was very easy. We turned around and just grabbed the DOM element by ID and did an inner HTML and dumped it right in. With XSS, things get slightly more complicated. But we've given you two very well understood paths to accomplish this. I would guess that 90% of the time, you will make a request to a proxy object in your domain that will make the request on your behalf and return the JSON results. It's the easiest way. It's the most secure way. And if you use a proxy object, you can also use one of those JSON libraries to ensure that you don't accidentally get any executable code in there. So that is absolutely the path I would recommend that you use until JavaScript 2.0 comes out and lets us do those things directly. If you do, in fact, need to do those things directly, like Google does and Yahoo does and everyone else, you can use that callback method. It's a well-known hack, but since everyone uses it, it's industry standard. <laughs> but we have two ways of accomplishing these things. The fact that I was using Groovy and Grails should make you all want to be Groovy and Grails developers. But I've said this over and over again, and I hope you believe that just because I was using Groovy and Grails doesn't mean that you have to as well. There are a whole host of Java libraries. There are a whole host of .NET libraries. There are a whole host of these various libraries out there. Because JSON, at the end of the day, is much like XML. Even though it has JavaScript in the title, that is because the client will presumably be in JavaScript but it doesn't preclude you from doing server-side development in C Sharp or Ruby or Java or Groovy or anything else. And that, my friends, is real world JSON. What final questions do you have? Or you can clap. Yes, let's clap first. <laughs> we do have time for questions. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, except the nice thing is, is that it, it just ships standard with um, Grails, so there's no additional jars you have to do. It's just a native part of the library. No, it does not do that. It doesn't do that, yeah. You are all now free to go. Thank you once again for your time and your enthusiasm. I really appreciate it.